this is Sarah Milligan with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the Oklahoma State University Library. Um, I'm down in Talhina. Today's date is November 9th, 2016, and I'm here with Dr. William Bill Martin. Um, and this interview is for a, a CEC interview that's for the O State Stories um, collection uh, through the Oral History Program. All right, that's about as formal as it gets. <laughs> Um, okay, so what what would help me is to get a little bit of background information about you. So where you were born and then sort of where you grew up, because I know those are different places. Yeah. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. My father was a, a native Tennessee, and my mother was actually from Pawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, they met in Birmingham, Alabama, right after the war. He was a World War II veteran, and she had worked in the defense plant, working mm -hmm. on hell divers and other Curtis aircraft. And I uh, don't know exactly how they, how they managed to meet, but they did. And then they, uh, after uh, falling in love, they uh, moved to Memphis. My dad uh, worked in a shoe store and then later uh, as a, uh, a uh, manager at the uh, Peabody Hotel at the, as a desk clerk, really. And uh, then finally uh, got a job at the post office with his... Uh, Civil service uh, gave him points for being a veteran, and so he, he got a job at the post office. Uh, my mother wanted to move back to Oklahoma, and as men often do, he said, okay, we'll do that, because he had a job that was transferable from mm. post office to post office. Uh, he was a mail handler. He was basically a physical laborer in the post office. You know, he had to sling those 70-pound mail sacks every, every night, and he worked at night. Uh, so definitely blue collar and definitely uh, no one in my family had ever gone to college. What was the draw, do you know, for your mom to want to move back to Oklahoma? Her family and uh, I think she just didn't feel comfortable around his family, uh, his mother in particular. Uh, I think from what I understand, she probably already had some early dementia and was getting very difficult to get along with. Uh, we were living in an old stucco uh, house that was being rented there in Memphis and uh, right next to a railroad track that was very noisy and occasionally caught the wood fence on fire behind us and things. And I don't know, there were a lot of things that played into it, but mostly family because she had a, a larger family than he did. and. Uh, she missed her sisters and, you know, brothers and sisters and other, other families. So they moved to Tulsa because she had been previously married and was uh, familiar with Tulsa. Her first husband was a preacher who beat her up frequently when he was drinking alcohol. And so uh, her daughter was still living in Tulsa, I think, at that time. And so that's why. Uh, and was her daughter an adult by the time you all moved back? Home? Yeah, she was an adult and actually was on her own as of 1941 or 42. Married the love of her life. Uh, they had uh, one son who was handicapped, who uh, had uh, uh, significant cognitive problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did fairly well because he worked for Mobile Oil. Her husband worked for Mobile Oil. And uh, so they were able to... Uh, get special education and institutionalized him, you know, when a lot of families wouldn't have been able to do that. But they were, because of his work, they moved around to South America, they moved to, uh, around eventually settling in uh, Louisiana, and uh, so I never saw her much. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't that much a part of my life. I always liked her and she liked me, but uh, we had a 27 year age difference. You know, mm -hmm. there again, that gender, and, and uh, age gap, but uh, uh, so you moved to Tulsa. How old were you when you moved? To I Tulsa? was five, I believe, four or five, and uh, they had me skip kindergarten because I was just turning at the age that I would have been eligible for first grade. So I went to first grade, and so I was younger than a lot of the kids that uh, were in first grade which wound up making me 17 when I went to college at OU, but I had a birthday soon after that. So. But um, in any event, uh, I grew up uh, 
in North Tulsa, but not far North Tulsa. It was still sort of on the fringe of midtown suburbia in those mm -hmm. days, Pine and Birmingham area. And, uh, but kind of isolated. There weren't a lot of kids my age in that area, and I was an only child, and so I didn't have uh, a lot of socialization. My mother got me interested in music because she played the guitar and liked uh, the old church songs and everything, and so she insisted that I take up the accordion, which, uh, of all things, you know? And uh, so I, uh, at age seven, I start the accordion, and I dutifully, you know, until age 14, I, I had lessons almost every week and all, but at age 14, I was interested in baseball and starting to get interested in girls but didn't know what to do with them, but I just gave up the idea of the accordion. And I, and I think that's regrettable because music has been a part of my life so much, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to read it anymore. I just enjoy it now. Yeah. The thing I play now is radio and TV and stereo. But, uh, so that had some influence, her loving music, and I had all kinds of music that I listened to when I was a kid in Memphis. They'd always listen to Nashville, and, mm -hmm. uh, to the Grand Ole Opry, and so I got to hear the original Hank Williams and stuff. Well, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm kind of curious, because the accordion is not really a traditional instrument that a lot of people pick up. But I wonder then if there was more popular culture or it was because access. of Lawrence Welk and all of that ilk, you know, and they had a very famous uh, accordion player named Myron Florin or something. And also there was a, an accordion group called the Harmonicats that played harmonicas and accordions that had a few hit songs in the early 50s. So I don't know other than near our house. Uh, not too far from a house on Lewis Street was uh, an accordion school, Stan Cotto School of Music. And they had accordion bands, nothing more atrocious than accordion bands. And uh, so uh, I got very good at playing that to where I was playing, you know, at venues and assemblies and such for school. But uh, I was very shy and it was not something I really enjoyed doing. But uh, anyway, I gave it up. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so what high school did you go to then? Went to Tulsa? Central High. I went to Cleveland Junior High and then to Central High School. And uh, that was the first parting of groups of friends I had was when I went from junior high to high school because many of them went to Will Rogers, which was Central's main rival. And uh, I still kept in touch with some of them. One of my best friends, uh, Terry McCain, went to Will Rogers. I went to Central. Mm -hmm. But we'd still get along. And we'd still, you know, and, uh, um, also, I had a, a friend uh, named Monty Mattingly who was uh, a Mormon who was always trying to proselytize me, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go that route. But uh, I wasn't really brought up in the church. Uh, my Mother uh, had gone to the First Christian Church. Father was Presbyterian. My father continued to go to church. My mother didn't after her, I think, uh, life with her first husband. It had soured her on, quote, religion. I think she still had religious feelings, believed in God, but organized religion was not something she kept up with. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, Central High, I... Uh, had good friends and I had, uh, uh, you know, I, I really wasn't sure what I was going to go into, but I was always a good student, well not always, and in the sixth grade I wanted to be like some of these bigger guys were and I wanted to be macho and so I was going to join a gang, you know, like the outsiders, mm -hmm. exactly like that, you know, they all had the ducktails, black leather jackets, my parents couldn't afford black leather jacket, but my mother got me in one of those vinyl ones that looked mm -hmm. kind of like black leather. You had to have the uh, the uh, rabbit's foot on the keychain. It did have that. Uh, I grew my hair long, had a ducktail, and uh, I was getting ready to get in this gang, and my parents found out about it because my grades started slipping, and they didn't know what was happening. And Mr. Taft, my uh, arithmetic math teacher, he called him in and blew the whistle on me, and I was very disappointed in that. I was very embarrassed about that, but I was mostly embarrassed because my grades were failing in math, and I'd never failed anything. And uh, so 
I was very embarrassed for my parents because they were shocked and I hated to hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of made up my mind I would never, I didn't want to ever do that again. And, uh, what did so, that entail? Like, you're on the verge of joining a gang. What did that actually mean? Like, Yeah, you, know, you have to have an initiation. And uh, they have you come into their, wherever they would meet. And they see if you're tough by seeing how many, lick, how many licks you can take on your shoulder. You know, mm -hmm. just a physical initiation. And if you don't holler out and all the guys in the gang can keep hitting you and you don't holler out, then you're a member of the gang. The worst thing they did, as far as I know, some minor thefts and such, but they stole hubcaps. That was a big thing. Sixth graders? Yeah. But they didn't have guns. You know, they were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, they, but they did have switchblades. That was the thing. That was the weapon of choice in the gangs, if not chains sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. There was something about me that was an outsider because I was an only child and I parents were older and I was wanting to kind of break away in some way. Mm -hmm. And so I, I you know, was thinking, you know, I kind of admired these guys because I thought they were cool. But uh, that stopped me. I, I didn't. Uh, one of the guys, John Dillard, that uh, was in the gang a couple of years later, maybe three years later, was killed when uh, uh, the car they were in was trying to elude the police, and he fired some shots at the police, and they shot a shotgun through the rear window and killed him. And uh, a couple of the other guys wound up in jail. And, uh, so, you so, know, there's twists and turns in life. Mm -hmm. So one of your teachers intervened? Essentially, yeah, yeah. yeah, did. Yeah, I remember what he said. He said, uh, Sonny Martin, okay, they sent me, call me Sonny, and I said, uh, I'm getting hot and heavy on you, boy. And he said that in front of the class, you know, whew, peer pressure, peer, you know, and uh, so, yeah. Anyway. So that was the, really the only time you had grade problems then? Yeah, yeah, I never did after that until I got later on at OU. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I graduated National Honor Society, I was Secretary of the National Honor Society at uh, Central High. I uh, enjoyed athletics, but I wasn't really good at anything. I was in cross country. I did wrestling for a while until I thought I could beat a guy that was 168 pounds and I was 120 and he about killed me. And so I, you know, but I enjoyed the athletics and so I've carried that on all my life. But partly because I was getting picked on in, in junior high because I was a little guy, and so I started doing push-ups and lifting weights and stuff a little too early because I'm paying for it now. But, uh, uh, you know, that's just been, been me. Uh, but then I uh, graduated, but I had no idea what I wanted to go into. Mm -hmm. But this was the era, uh, you know, 50s and, and 60s, where the space race was on, and uh, Eisenhower, I remember, was calling for more education in math and sciences. And uh, the thing for male students to go into was math and science. And I was good at math and science. But I was good at English. I was good at everything because I didn't want to fail. I was afraid of failing. And uh, so anyway, I went to my high school advisor because I was confused. If I'm getting A's and all these things. I'm in mean, National Honor Society. I don't know what I want to go into. I, I never took high school biology. I'm not, I think it was because the class was full. I know I was going to take Spanish and class was full, so I took French, which I've never been able to use. Too bad it wasn't Spanish. Mm -hmm. But uh, in any event, I, I'll never forget this. Uh, my high school advisor said, uh, well, you need to hit the door running. As soon as you get to college, you need to know what you're going to go into. And you're good in math and science. And uh, worst advice I ever had. And But I took it as, uh, I guess he's right, he's older than me. So I thought, okay. And uh, some of my friends, I remember particularly Eddie Childers, uh, who's a Native American, I really liked him admired him, he was good in math science, and he was going into uh, electrical engineering. But because I made model airplanes, and I had always enjoyed uh, reading about World War II aircraft, my mother had worked in the aircraft industry, 
I thought, uh, okay, aerospace engineering, that's it. And uh, so I pointed myself in that direction, not because I felt the calling or knew that that's what I should be good at, because my dad wasn't mechanical and I wasn't really and I didn't have that aptitude, it seemed. But I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. That's what the advisor said to do. So that's what I got into. And because of that, and because I really had this idea that I wanted to be an astronaut, mm -hmm. I admired those guys so much. I read everything I could about the space program and all the latest jet planes and everything. So I joined Air Force ROTC and the first thing they do is just like you're joining the military, they give you a physical, and I didn't realize this, but I had 2400 vision. My right eye had been injured, I, I'd never had it followed up. You know, you didn't go to the doctor in those days, but when I was playing softball, not baseball, when I was in uh, like uh, sixth grade, uh, hit really hard in the right eye by a softball. I don't know that that's what did it, and doctors haven't said for sure if they knew what, you know, but, uh, my parents had good eyesight until they were old and everything. And I had 20-20 up to that point. But uh, anyway, he said, well, you'll never be a pilot when they did the physical. And here I am the very first day in ROTC, and I'm being told I can't do the very thing that I wanted to do. So I learned how to shine shoes and brass buckles and all that stuff in Air Force ROTC. But after the first year, I dropped out of it because, you know, I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But I continued making good grades. I was in President's Honor Roll for the first two years, straight A's. I got in a couple of honorary scholastic fraternities and all that, but no social fraternities. Uh, but by my third year in college, I uh, got into my hardcore engineering courses. And it seemed like most of those were being taught by graduate students who weren't really good teachers, and one of them in particular, strength of materials, which if you're going to go into aerospace engineering, one of the most important classes you've got to have. Because you study, you know, what causes metal fatigue, what causes things to break. And uh, so I'd been great in physics, great in math, great in chemistry, but I got to that course, and I couldn't understand the instructor. He had a very thick Iranian accent. He was a, from Iran. And he was teaching this important course, and all the guys kind of complained about that, you know. But he was real smart, you know, and so he was in the top flight of the, you know, the people in the engineering college. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe it's just me. But the book was not very helpful, and so you need a good teacher. And I just wasn't getting it. And I didn't have mechanical aptitude. And I started having some doubts, but I also, by this time, 1967, I had not had a lot of political awareness. And uh, I kind of liked President Kennedy, and I was shocked as everybody was when he was killed, but my parents were both Republicans. But uh, I, you know, when I went to college at OU, I decided I was happy to go. I was happy to leave the nest. I can't understand all these guys that are in their 30s and 40s staying with their parents now. But, but uh, I was wanting to see the big world and get out of this little cluster I've been in. And, uh, but that, you know, I, I liked people and I liked, I wanted to help people in some way. If I couldn't be an astronaut, I wanted to do something that help people. Because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a Marine, I wanted to be a policeman, I wanted to be whatever, fireman, all those things a boy goes through in that, you know, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so I started, my political awareness really started more because uh, I was wondering, I was starting to have my doubts about the Vietnam War, and uh, Robert Kennedy came to OU at the field house there. I don't think they had the field house anymore. It's where they used to play basketball. Mm -hmm. But uh, he came there in March of 1967. And I, it was standing room only because there was a Kennedy, you know. And uh, I, I kind of liked him from her, things I'd seen on TV. You know, but here was a guy, you know, he was a little guy, but he was, he was tough and he had been tough on 
the mob when he was the attorney general and, and uh, all this stuff. And I thought, well, you know, and I was so impressed by him because here he was in the middle of Oklahoma. He wasn't running for anything then. He was a senator in New York. But uh, he, he gave his speech and he was funny and he, you know, uh, at that time there was a popular song out by a group that was doing a cover on Wild Thing, only they had the voices of Ted Kennedy and Jack and Robert Kennedy, or no, the voice of Robert Kennedy and Ethel in it. And uh, he, he joked, I don't think so, I think it sounds like Teddy. But uh, he then stayed after his speech for over an hour, maybe an hour and a half, just answering questions, you know. And I thought, uh, wow. Well, you know, this guy's got it right. He was against welfare. He thought that was the worst thing we could do. You know, people have to have a reason to work. And so you don't pay them not to work. And I thought, well, that's cool. You know, I, I agree. And uh, so anyway, that started my political awareness. And I started uh, reading more about the war. And the more I read, the more I didn't like it. And I, I joined Student Action, which was not a radical group like SDS or anything, but uh, it it caused me to think a lot about, you know, why am I going into aerospace engineering? I don't feel right in that. And, you know, they're making planes that drop bombs and all this stuff. And uh, so I didn't know what to do. And so finally my grades started slipping in these core engineering courses. <clears throat> and I was spending more time, you know, canvassing for certain candidates and such. Uh, 1968 came along and Robert Kennedy, I thought, cool, you know, the guy I want. And then he was shot, Martin Luther King was shot. Uh, Gene McCarthy, you know, was, you know, the, the establishment politicians in the Democratic Party booted him out. And, Hubert Humphrey takes over, and oh God, and so I was lost there, you know, I lost my political affiliation, and uh, I was just lost. I, I was not liking what I was doing, but I couldn't just drop out because I would get drafted. And I, I thought, you know, I, I don't believe in that war. I demonstrate against that war. I did participate in the first Earth Day, but I didn't, you know. Uh, so I, I got to, I just thought, well, I want to get as far away from engineering as I can, and maybe I can figure out what I want to do before I get drafted. And uh, so what did I do? I uh, changed my major to English literature. <laughs> and... Uh, I was in that for a couple of months and realized, well, this isn't it either. I mean, it was my first exposure to instructors who were gay, and I thought, oh, man, you know. And plus, it was like they are trying to tell me what I should be getting out of reading Steinbeck or Hemingway or whatever, and I get what I get out of it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be fed that. I wanted to have my own ideas. And so I wasn't happy in that. And so, but I was in that for long enough that, you know, I was not going to graduate in my fourth year. And so that was the end of my student deferment coming up. And believe me, don't, Uncle Sam knew that. And so even though I had a high draft number, they were still drafting guys like crazy. And so I was drafted. And uh, I thought that was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. So that really required some soul searching. But I wanted to serve my country, but I didn't want to go to Canada. I didn't want to do all this nonsense. I thought that'd be a chicken shit thing to do. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I let myself go to the induction and all of that stuff, and then uh, wound up in Fort Leonard Wood. Um, Where's Fort Leonard Wood? It's in Missouri, uh, and it was uh, in November and December, coldest place I'd ever been much colder than Oklahoma. And uh, 
first day we were on the rifle range, uh, the wind chill was 30 below zero. And so you didn't care whether you hit the target or not. You know, you just want to get back into that stove in that tent and warm up a little bit. What was kind of funny was because I had a bad right eye, I uh, couldn't fire an M16 with my right hand because I couldn't see well enough. I right? didn't have glasses. I'd never worn glasses. And so the Army said, well, we're going to have to get you glasses. So they gave me a left-handed M16. And with that left-handed M16, I was hitting the bullseye. I was making, you know, I was putting three shots within like a half dollar. And a drill sergeant came up to me and said, son, where'd you learn to shoot like that? I said, I don't know. I've never fired a gun in my life. I said, well, well, anyway, my glasses came and they gave me a right-handed rifle. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't hit as well with that. I was, you know, and I... So anyway, uh, they uh, said my scores that they had, you know, when they brought us in, they gave us a bunch of testing. They said mm -hmm. my scores were high enough. I could do anything I wanted in the military. So you don't have to be a grunt if you don't want to. I said, well, I don't really want to, you know. But uh, so I said, well, if I don't, what do you think they'll put me in if I don't enlist for an extra year? And he said, combat engineering, because of your math background. I said, well, what do they do? And the guy was very blunt. He said, 99% combat, 1% engineering. <sighs> okay. Uh, so I thought about it. I said, well, look, uh, maybe I will enlist for an extra year. I don't, you know, I, was thinking, I didn't tell him that. I, I really don't want to do that. But uh, in any event, I had gotten a letter from a, a close friend of mine who had been a pre-med major, who was my roommate in college, and then we'd gotten an apartment and uh, off campus, the Creatley Apartments, I don't know if they're still there, but uh, he uh, didn't get accepted in medical school at the same time that I was getting drafted. And so they put him in the lab tech school in Fort Sam Houston. And uh, he wrote me a letter telling me how great that school was and how he was just amazed at how they could concentrate everything down, break it down to the essentials. And he was enjoying that. I, uh, I had to be able to go from basic training directly into this other training, uh, or they they'd put me in common engineering. And so uh, the guy, called me into a prefab, and this impressed me that he actually called the Pentagon for the little old me, and he had a book there of MOSs, and uh, he said, uh, here's uh, optician school, you know, would you want to do that? Because he, he asked me if I want to do something in the medical field if I didn't feel like I wanted to serve as a combatant, and I said, yeah, what have you got? And so anyway, that was going to be at Fort uh, Fitzsimmons in Denver, and I thought, okay, the slopes and the girls, that'd be good. Uh, but it was filled up. So then he said, okay, here's dental technician school. And uh, I said, okay, I'll do that, you know, that's fine, whatever. And they were filled up. That was going to be in Denver also. Uh, and so... Lo and behold, the next thing he pulled up to was uh, uh, after combat medic training, they would give you lab training, and you could get into the lab technician school. And I remembered that letter, and I thought, okay, I, okay, where do I sign? I'll do that. Because they'd put me in a prefab building before they took me to that building, and they, I was sitting on this bench with five other guys, and you know, Green Beret had jumped up on the stage and started telling us how great it was to be a Green Beret, jumping out of airplanes and doing all this stuff. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, why did they put me in here? And the sergeant, black sergeant, he came and he uh, interrupted the Green Beret, excuse me, just me, he said, Private Martin, we've got you in the wrong place. I said, you're shelling me. <laughs> So, so anyway, that you brought me that other prefab, and and that's how I signed up for that. Didn't know what I was doing because I'd never even had uh, high school biology. But uh, 
to make a long story short, I uh, got the lab training. I was uh, hoping when they gave us our dream sheets that I had to go through the combat medic training and all that. So I was going to be used both as combat medic and as a lab tech, depending on where they sent me. Mm -hmm. And you get these dream sheets where you put down where you would like to go after you get your training. And I thought, well, I've really loved the lab school. The lab school was wonderful. It opened a whole door for me. It was like one of those uh, kind of uh, eureka moments. This is what I want to do. Was that the first time you really felt that way? Oh, yeah. First time in my life that I knew that I loved this. Because I would liked dinosaurs when I was a kid and the big Latin names and everything, and I was good at that. I gave a presentation. They're great at the dinosaurs. Put everybody to sleep. <laughs> And so uh, I, uh, I learned Fasciolopsis, Buski, and uh, uh, Nicator Americanus, and all that stuff. I love that, all those different things that infected GIs, you know. And the bacteria were wonderful. I loved that. And uh, so, uh, you know, I thought, yeah, this is, this is great. It was. It was, even to this day, it was the best, most concentrated learning experience I've ever had. But they drilled us in there at 7 a.m., gave us 15 minutes for lunch, and we were there till 7 p.m. I mean, they were serious. They were uh, training us. And uh, I didn't have any problem drawing blood, didn't have any problem doing all that. And uh, so I, uh, you know, on the dream sheet, I thought, boy, this is cool, and I want to learn more about this, and I knew they were doing uh, a lot of uh, government studies and things at Walter Reed. So I signed up for Walter Reed, thinking, you know, if I'm lucky, maybe they'll send me there. Like post-training? Yeah. Got done lab school? Well, I would actually work as a lab tech, but you would be involved in research and things there. And I thought that would be just right, maybe... That way I'll be a path to something. So anyway, uh, when uh, we had three guys in our company that signed up for Vietnam, they wanted to go gun -ho. They wanted to go to Vietnam in, in my lab school. And when the orders came down, all three of those guys went to Walter Reed. And I went to Vietnam. And in fact, 80% of the guys that were in that class went to Walter Reed. It was one of those fickle fingers of fate, you know. And I was just crushed by that. And I uh, walked outside and I sat down on top of a trash can. The lid fell in the, <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, the trash can. And uh, a friend of mine, oh. <laughs> friend of mine laughed at me, you know. And uh, <laughs> we went uh, into the uh, into the barracks, and I was commiserating with him. I thought, boy, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. I mean, I demonstrated against this war. I don't know how this. But he was married, and he was had been worried about going to Vietnam, and he got to go to Wall Street. So I was glad for him. And uh, went to the bathroom, and. Uh, I, we helped, kept our caps in our belt, and my cap fell in the toilet. <laughs> and we were going to have an inspection, and he had an extra cap, and so he let me use my cap. But after that, he always, you know, if I said something he didn't agree with, he'd say, go shit in your hat. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Only did you fall in the trash can. Yeah, it was, you know, it was just one of these things, you know, like... Uh, I think Al Cap had that guy, Joe, the fiddle speaker or something, and he had a little cloud over his head all the time. And uh, I thought, boy, I'm just like that guy. You know? But I, I thought about it, thought about it, and finally I went to my drill sergeant. I said, drill sergeant, I don't know how, I'm not sure how I'm going to perform in, you know, in Vietnam. I, it's not that I don't want to, but I don't want to kill people, and I don't want, you know, I, I demonstrated against that war. I just, I don't want to go. And so he immediately called over to the infirmary, got a hold of a psychiatrist over there, and sent me to the psychiatrist. And so I said this to the psychiatrist. I, I probably wasn't in there five minutes. 
he listened to me. And I explained, you know, I mean, conscientiously, I, I really think this war is wrong. And I think it's not going to turn out right for this country, for the people. I just don't believe in it. And so he reached into his desk drawer and pulled out a little bottle of Valium. And I'll never forget those words. He said, uh, Private Martin, whenever you get a little bit nervous, just take one of these. And I was kind of stunned, you know. And I, I want to tell him, hey, I'm not nuts. I just don't want to go get it. <laughs> but anyway, I knew, you know, well, I got to do what I got to do. So. Uh, Can I ask you, did you, when you explained to the military side of this that you had, uh -huh. You had protested against this? Yeah. Was, yeah, what did they say to that? Was there? He didn't say anything. I don't remember that he actually made a comment on it. He listened to me, and I thought, this is good. He's a good listener. And then he did the military thing. He gave me the pills and said, you know, go do battle. So, uh, you know, and unfortunately that still goes on. That's why there's the suicide right now. But anyway, uh, I... I went back to the barracks and uh, I took that bottle of Valium and flushed it. I didn't want pills. I'd never used pills. I you know, wasn't alcoholic. I thought, boy, that's not right. I'm going to take pills. So you even knew at that point like that that was just not what you needed? No. Yeah. No, I didn't want that. I, I. How old were you at this point? Well, I was older than the other guys. I was 21, 22. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys were 18, 19. And uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, I uh, went to Vietnam. Uh, I, you know, they gave you 30 days off to make out your will or whatever it was and, and you know, and enjoy time and think about things and then you go. And so I went, 22 hour flight. And uh, on the way there, I thought this was kind of funny. You know, I was, of course, depressed about the way things had happened. But uh, several of us knew the song from uh, Woodstock Country Joe and the Fish. Uh, you know, feel like I'm fixing to die rag. So we all started singing that on the plane, you know. Uh, and uh, so, you know, okay, well, we'll do whatever. And uh, landed there in Vietnam. It was nighttime. It was real dark, and there's these people running around with these coolie hats. And, black pajamas and stuff, and I thought, how do they know who's the good guys? And you don't. Uh, but uh, anyway, I remembered, I, I just kept in my mind, well, that sergeant there that I enlisted, he told me, well, you know, you're going to be a lab tech, and they need them more in, in uh, Saigon and such, so you'll be an air-conditioned lab in Saigon. So I thought, okay, that's all right. Uh, but no, uh, first they sent me up to Da Nang on the DMZ, but they didn't really need a lab tech there, even a combat medic there. And so they sent me back down to Quignon, which is halfway down the country, on the coast. I remember flying over the beaches there, and I thought, oh, this place is beautiful. You know, as your beaches, the water was clear. You could see the fish and stuff down there as I came over in the helicopter. And I thought, boy, if this country wasn't at war, this would be a tourist paradise. Uh, but uh, it was at war. And so uh, in Quignon, they said, oh, no, we need you for a medical detachment in Pleiku. I didn't know where that was, you know. So uh, they helicoptered me to, to Pleiku, which had been a bigger facility, but it had been downgraded from a, a, an evacuation hospital to just a medical detachment, which is small, mm -hmm. it's smaller than a mass unit. And, uh, uh, but we would get triage cases coming in. I'd work in the, uh, the triage area, but then I'd go back and I'd type and cross-match blood and I'd have to draw units of blood there on the spot because we didn't have a blood bank. You know, mm -hmm. I had to get it from the guys that were there. And I'd identify malarial parasites and all that stuff, uh, you know. And the very first day I was there, we had a mortar attack. You know, I was just 
more scared than I've ever been in my life. I could actually taste copper pennies. I'd read that in something, I don't know if, what book it was, you know, that when you got really scared, you tasted the copper pennies. And, uh, but uh, on one of the mortar attacks, first day or two I was there, uh, there was a, a, a round that landed right next to where the lab was, but I wasn't in there. I was in the hallway that had been adjoining the uh, morgue in the old hospital. And uh, this fluorescent lights came down on me, and uh, my ears rang. It was like my ears rang for 24 hours. I mean, it was like I had trouble hearing. And uh, uh, one of the Vietnamese hooch maids there saw me and uh, started laughing at me. And uh, I, I said, why are you laughing? And she said, because you look like a, a ma, which was the Vietnamese word for ghost. You look like a ghost. <laughs> and I'm sure I did, because they hadn't even given me a flak jacket or a helmet yet. You know, I mean, it was kind of disorganized. They had got me in there so quick, you know. And uh, so uh, I had... Uh, run outside to see what they needed me to do and I heard this guy in the in the uh, dental part of the, the at the end of the hallway there he hollered at me hey you are you nuts he said get back here because we had a revetment around us to protect us from the travel and I I was standing out there and, and I heard a rocket go landed I don't know, probably half a mile away and I, he kind of woke me up, and so I came back in. And, and we were friends. I thought I had a guy named Frank, big afro. And uh, so anyway, uh, I was there a year and four days. I, uh, you know, eventually fell in love with this little hooch maid who was very sharp and had such a good sense of humor. Uh, but it had a terrible life because she had been captured by the VC at one point, and that uh, she escaped. Uh, had had to, uh, as the eldest child in their family, had to uh, kind of fend for herself, and she would jump on trains and go to Quinion and uh, would steal food there and bring it back to her family. And uh, I would, uh, while I was there, I would. Uh, uh, sneak off when I there was another lab tech there at the time, but he was fixing to ropes. He was fixing to leave in a couple of months, and so I had him to kind of follow along and learn the ropes. In fact, I got my nickname. Everybody has nicknames in the army, and, and uh, because they saw me following this guy around like a little dog, they called me Sidekick. They didn't know what my name was. There goes Sidekick. And uh, so anyway. Uh, I uh, found that there was a truck that the, the kitchen workers were all Vietnamese. And at the end of the supper meal, this truck would take them back and they would have to have uh, one of the guys from the compound go as a guard on that truck. And so I paid a little money to one of the guys that was a guard and I would hop on that truck and I would go down in town and spend the night in the ville and then I'd come back. And uh, got away with that until near the, almost near the very end. And uh, the CO uh, got wind of it. And uh, uh, I just got back and I was real bleary eyed. And he, uh, he was from the British Army and then he transferred to the American Army. And he said, uh, well, uh, Private Martin, uh, are you tripping out? I said, no, sir, I'm just tired. He said, uh, how come? And I, well, sir, uh, I don't want to tell you this, but I've been to the bill and I came back. And he didn't do anything. He could have court-martialed me or whatever they do. He didn't. He said, well, don't let me catch you doing that again. And I didn't. I still did it, but he didn't catch me doing it again. And, uh, so what were, why were you going down there? To visit this little hooch maid, you know. It was one of those things that fate threw us together, and you know, you're living on your adrenaline, and it's one of those things Maslow talked about, peak experiences in life. And so everything was exaggerated, I think. You know, my emotions, everything, and for her too. And so uh, I was supposed to 
leave the country in 10 months. But as fate would have it again, uh, we got ourselves surrounded. Uh, they had what was known as the Easter Offensive. And uh, the North Vietnamese came rushing down like they did in the Tet Offensive. And they cut us off from Quinyon, which was our supply room. And so we could only be brought food and supplies by a helicopter or the air base was not that far away from us and uh, by air. And so I was, uh, I was supposed to have an R&R &R and that was canceled and my D-Rose was canceled so I, I had to stay there and I was the only lab tech there by that time. They didn't, you know, uh, the other guy had been long gone. And I was the only one that could type and cross-match blood. I was the only one that could, uh, uh, you know, check malaria smears and all of this. I was it for 100 miles. And 100 miles in Vietnam was like 1,000 miles. And mm -hmm. so uh, we were about 20 miles from Cambodia. We didn't know how this was going to come out, but we were right next to the, the uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, you know, the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, what got us unsurrounded was the South Koreans. Uh, they were brutal. They, they, they took no prisoners. They busted their way through and opened up the road. And eventually the Americans, because of their air power and helicopters, were able to beat, beat the North Vietnamese back temporarily. But we knew it wasn't going well. Vietnamization was not working. Uh, you know, Nixon was saying that we didn't have any ground troops in Vietnam as of such and such a date, and that's a lie. You know, we were getting them helicoptered in every day. And, uh, you know, to hear that on Armed Forces Radio and realize that your president is lying to you. He's lying to the silent majority. And uh, so, you know, the, the joke was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the M16s were on the black market at that time. And the joke was that uh, when they sold them, they said, well, this is a, a practically new M16. Uh, uh, it's uh, never been fired and it's only been dropped once. You know, because the, the Vietnamese army was not really supportive of their government, which we were propping up, because they were Catholics. And most of Vietnamese were either non denominational or they were Buddhist. And uh, we knew this out in the field. That, did the people at home know this? And uh, so anyway, uh, we knew it was, you know, this just isn't going to work. And it didn't. But uh, by this time, uh, Wendy was, was her nickname on the compound. She was pregnant. And... Uh, a lot of guys had done this, but they just left them there. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the fate for them would not be good. Uh, Vietnam was a very racist country, and they were very racist against people of Caucasian or French descent and such, because French had been, you know, had colonized them. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I, 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 my heart was all entangled with this, this young girl there, and I, she was 19. And so I, uh, I thought, man, what am I going to do? So I, I thought, okay, I'm going to bring her to the United States. And I had managed to slip her into my room and hide her there for a while. And uh, even through inspections, uh, we had a, oh, I would get the word to her that we're going to have an inspection. And she would lubricate the sliding door there on my hooch. And the, the window was a plexiglass window, and she'd slide it, and she'd get in between the, the hooch and the revetment that protected us from mortars and duck down in there. And they never caught her. If they caught her, they would turn her over to the Vietnamese police, and they were not nice people, and so on. That, that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty risky thing. It was. And uh, anyway, I had a buddy who was... Uh, working in the office and he knew what went on there and so he would kind of tell me when the inspections were coming down and uh, he also told me that uh, the the captain uh, was had put me in for a, a bronze star and uh, the uh, CO because of his awareness of me and the fact that I had uh, objected to him putting all of the company weapons in the uh, 
in the lab building, which had a big red cross painted on the top of it, and it was against the Geneva Convention, and I, I had objected to that. And uh, so, anyway, he, he didn't care for me, so if he'd caught me, it would have been bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the guy told me, uh, uh, John Pemberton, he said, oh, by the way, he downgraded your Bronze Star to a, an Army commendation medal. Well, it was fine. I didn't care. I felt like that should go to the guys that are mostly out in the boonies. That's, that's the way it ought to be. But uh, anyway, I managed to get her on uh, an ambulance that was carrying blood uh, and plasma supplies. Uh, and got her on a plane, thanks to John Pemberton, that was flying to Saigon and got her out of there because we were still surrounded at that time. And we didn't know how that was going to go. They'd evacuated the female, there was two female nurses, they evacuated them and they said they were just going to keep the uh, uh, essential personnel, which <laughs> we all joke that means the expendable person. <laughs> And, uh, so how many people did they leave then, roughly? Uh, there was one doctor, uh, and uh, there was uh, basically just us medics. You know, they evacuated the nurses out, mm -hmm. no nurses. And uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, after I got back in country, it took, uh, into, into the United States. Uh, so she's in Saigon right she's now? She's in then. Saigon. Okay. And so I, uh, I, I uh, kept writing to her, and she could understand English well enough that she could write me back, and she would have a friend of hers there in Saigon help her. And so her due date was in June of, uh, or sorry, uh, July of, of uh, 72. And so, so that would be three months after I had left country. And, uh, or actually, no, not that. I left June 4th, and so it was, you know, just about a month and a half after I left country. But I kept writing to her, and I kept thinking, well, I don't know what's in store for me, but, you know, I, I, I've got to bring her here. And so I did. And, uh, but it took a year, and I had a lot of, wonder and doubts about it, but I, it took a year and I had to send some money to grease some corrupt officials in that government that were propping it. And uh, got her here. Uh, and, you know, she wasn't here. I mean, as soon as she got off the plane, you know, she's pregnant again. We got, <laughs> that was my son. But, uh, but it was so tough for her because it was so totally different. It was third world country. I mean, I mean, she was living in a shanty that was built from, you know, the, uh, the corrugated buildings and everything that the army, you know, bulldozed. They would make homes out of, and they didn't have any electric lights or anything. I mean, it was so. It was a total culture shock here. I did uh, help teach her English, and then I got her in an English course at. Uh, uh, one of the junior highs that they were offering to people that were coming from there. Where did you come back to then? Was it in Oklahoma or was it someplace else? Yeah, it was Oklahoma. It was? At, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm trying to leave some of the doubt, but I was, by then I was at Fort Riley, Kansas, but they transferred me to uh, Salina, Kansas to work at, at a waiting wives place there. It had been an air base, but for the wives of uh, soldiers, marines, airmen that were in Vietnam, that this was where they were, and there was a shilling medical clinic there, and so I was the lab tech there. Okay. That's where they sent me. But for that year that uh, I waited to get her back, I was at Fort Riley. And... Uh, Didn't the military know that you were trying to bring her over? Was that part of the process, or did No, that... they, they tried to keep you from doing that if they knew much about it, and so... Uh, so that was all, you know, me and her. And uh, uh, the sad thing being that, yes, we did come back to uh, Oklahoma after I got out of the Army, but they, one thing the Army did was, uh, because she was pregnant with my son, they allowed me to extend six months so that she could give birth, you know, at the expense of the Army. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good thing. And uh, 
So then. So you helped her learn English. You helped her get into some English. Taught her how to drive. Taught her how to handle checkbook. All of those kinds of things. But uh, she started having what I see now as probably was PTSD. And uh, would have these violent temper tantrums when she was under stress. Violent, meaning physically violent, and I had never experienced that. I didn't know how to handle that. And of course, there's no Vietnamese psychiatrist, and I couldn't have afforded that anyway. Mm -hmm. When I got back, I started knocking on doors, and within a couple of weeks, I had a job at the osteopathic hospital, which it was then. In Tulsa? Yeah. And uh, as a lab tech, of course, I had to start on the lowest rung because they didn't recognize Army training as giving you. Uh, a, a license as a lab technician or technician or technologist, but because as low man on the totem pole and I was getting just a little bit more than minimum wage, uh, I was assigned the stools and the urines and such. But I enrolled at TU under the GI Bill, mm -hmm. and the GI Bill in those days was wonderful, and it covered my TU uh, uh, schooling and also most of my medical school. I mean, it was amazing. It doesn't do that anymore, but, yeah. but uh, I wound up with only $7,000 owed when I got out of medical school. I had kind of hoped to go into pathology, but because of my lab training and because I eventually did a grandfather in under, I, I, I knew how to cross-match blood, I knew how to do all those things medical technologists do, but they wouldn't let me do it until I got some sort of official certification. And so I took the uh, HEW test in 1977, uh, passed with flying colors, and so I was certified by American Medical Technologist as a medical technologist, and so my income jumped up at that point. Wendy had uh, started working uh, as a seamstress and uh, worked at various places and then started her own little business as a seamstress. But she kept having all these, and she didn't think I was going to be able to become a doctor. Her friend, a friend of hers, kept telling her, "He'll, he'll never make it. He's going to have to, you know, he's wasting time and money and all this stuff." And and so we were having a lot of friction. And uh, her, one of her Vietnamese friends was married to an insurance salesman, and he had a boat and a nice house and all this stuff. And uh, and her friend kept telling her that, you know, he, you know, he's not smart enough to be a doctor. Why, you know, why do you stick with him and all this? And so it was, it was tough. And but inside me, I, th I thought, no, I, I can do this. You know, I, I told myself that when I got a degree in something medical, I should probably maybe try to go to uh, try to be a doctor because I was so impressed with what I saw. The the two doctors I saw there that I worked with in Vietnam, I was mm -hmm. just so impressed with that. And uh, so, anyway, I, I got a degree in microbiology because I loved all of the germs and all of the horrible things that cause disease. Was that from TU then? Yeah. That was a degree from TU? Yeah, yeah. And I took organic chemistry, two semesters of that, which I didn't have to do. I took biochemistry, but I wanted to do the hard thing. I wanted to be good at that so I would be good at microbiology. And I was doing better in organic chemistry than all the petroleum engineers were. Because, and I, that made me feel good because I was, you know, older than those guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, in any event, uh, things went sour in our marriage. And, and uh, she pulled a knife on me a few times and she was, and uh, so I won't go into all of that. Right. But we eventually divorced. Uh, was she able to stay in the country by that point? Oh, yeah. Then? Yeah, and still runs a business there, her, her seamstress business in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And uh, How old were your kids by that point? Uh, my son was 10, and my uh, daughter was 12. And this was about the time you got finished with TU then? No, this was actually... Uh, actually after I had uh, become a doctor. Oh. But she had, uh, I mean, uh, we'd talk about everything, but eventually I thought it's better for the kids not to see all this. And 
And, but it was my fault. I mean, I, I didn't know how to handle that kind of stress. I didn't know how to deal with the emotion problems she had, and I didn't even, until I became a doctor, I didn't even have an awareness of why she was having them. And I, I just, it was a failure in my character. It, it, it led to all that. But my salvation was that I, I focused on my medical career and I, I somehow I, I managed to that, that was my therapy in a way for dealing with having to leave the kids and her and I knew I couldn't stay in Tulsa because of her being there and uh, because she would she would call me on the phone constantly as she would come there and <clears throat> embarrass me uh, it was just in your office space or in your school she space? Would, she would have. Oh, okay. Yeah. And she did that while I was a lab tech. And uh, so, anyway, uh, I went to Valiant, and that's how I got into uh, rural medicine. Yeah. Because there was a doctor there who mentored me, and it was very valuable to me, Dr. Jones. And uh, the purpose of the osteopathic college was to provide... Uh, medical care in rural areas. That was the whole purpose of it. And of course, I know you're working for OSU. It was an OSU in those days. It was mm -hmm. state funded as a private institution, uh, not under a particular umbrella of a university. Mm -hmm. But eventually they, they became that in 1987, I think it was. And so I have a degree from OSU, even though I never attended there. But I still, you know, I root for them. But I also see I was an alumni of OU, even though yeah. I didn't graduate from there. And I graduated from TU, so I've had the spectrum of the major colleges. Well, and that's not uncommon, though. But I, well, and I wonder, so I wonder a few things. I wonder, um, yeah. um, when you did go, so, so help me understand a little bit about that difference between you went to the osteopathic, right? So you did the osteopathic school uh -huh. with the idea that that was really channeling into rural well, health care. Well, I, I, I had worked by that time in uh, the lab for seven years at mm -hmm. the osteopathic hospital. So I knew all the doctors. I'd seen the intern classes come through, the good ones and the mm -hmm. bad ones. And... Uh, I got good recommendations, you know, from Dr. Stanley Grog, from, you know, from others. And uh, the only thing about it was uh, every one of them, and all of the nurses there that knew me and everything, they were all pulling for me, but every one of them said, well, we're going to expect more out of you when you're an intern. <laughs> so, oh boy. So I made sure that every procedure I could get in, everything, you know, and some of the guys would hold back and they, they were, you know, and they would let the residents do it. And I'd say, you know, the residents say, you want to put it in a patient? Yeah. And so, uh, but that was good because that was the purpose of the Osteopathic College. They wanted you to be independent, to think independently, to be able to work without all these specialists around you to catch you if you mm -hmm. fail, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that thinking was right. Mm -hmm. And this is backed up by the fact that uh, when I was an extern and an intern working in these different hospitals, they sent me to Thomas, Oklahoma, to a little hospital, and to Grand Valley Hospital in Pryor. Uh, the nurses would always say, you know, you DO students, seem to have a lot on the ball. You seem to have much more confidence than the MD students do. And I'd hear this over and over. And uh, I, it made me feel proud because, you know, I was proud of my school. I was proud of the education I got in. In those days, they had a, a three-year uh, program. So you didn't get a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, you went through everything in three years, which was good for me because I was older. And I knew I didn't have the money to go on and go into pathology. I needed to get out and start making some mm -hmm. money for my family. And so I, I, that was a good thing. So that was your coursework, your residency, your everything? They didn't call it residency in those days. It was uh, the internship, and, and that was all ball wax. And then 
uh, your, after your, you know, after your internship, you had a license. Uh, that actually, though, that that internship year was your residency, then. and uh, I've never found that to be deficient. I mean, I've I've always done well, uh, and actually. Residencies and, and uh, board certification wasn't the big deal at that point, which was 1982, mm -hmm. as it became in subsequent years. And so I wasn't board certified. But uh, finally in 2001, because I was going back into private practice, I'd been with the Chicksaws for five years. My life kind of had five year cycles where I, you know, I decided this wouldn't good enough or I you know I, I was going to get better paid doing this and so mm -hmm. I, you know five seven year cycles longest time I was with anyone was with the veterans and I felt like I wanted that to be the end thing I did mm -hmm. sort of coming full circle you know mm -hmm. giving back to the veterans because they had given to me and, and the army had given to me so long story short the, what I thought was the worst thing that could have happened turned out to be the best thing that could have happened for me. Getting drafted, going into a, a war I didn't believe in, and uh, then uh, the military giving me the opportunity through the GI Bill to become a physician. And I, uh, I, I think that uh, my story is unique, I'm sure, in a lot of ways. Uh, but the need for uh, physicians in rural areas is still there, and I think it's even greater in a way because I see too much concentration of physicians in the metropolitan areas in this country. Much too much. And they're losing the touch. Uh, I uh, have gone to MD physicians and even uh, a, a DO physician, uh, you know, wanting medical evaluation of myself over the years and I mean they would talk to me a lot and stand across the room and then sort of play like they're putting a stethoscope to my chest and not doing the physical exam and to me I thought what what what, what are they being taught nowadays you know I mean they've got to know the physical exam. You aren't always going to have computers that will tell you what the diagnosis is and all this stuff, even though I love that and I think it's wonderful. I think that added five years to my practice life by having a PDA and then a smartphone that I could carry everything right there, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I, I'm sure it's maybe coming back around. Maybe the, the awareness that you've got to, got to put people first and and not, you know, technology's fine, but uh, I think maybe it's going to come back around to that. So I, one of the things that you mentioned was um, that when you were in school for this, it was, it, it was specifically geared towards getting medical personnel in rural areas mm -hmm. and that there was... That was certainly what was talked about, but that was true, too. I mean, that's, that's what I said. So do you think that your training there was different than maybe other training in, in other programs that maybe weren't geared towards that, or has, has some of that shifted? I think uh, part of it was the philosophy of uh, the osteopathic schools and taking people that have had life experience. Mm -hmm. I think that was key, because that was what I've been told throughout my career. Uh, that relates to bedside manner, to being able to explain disease to patients and their families, being able to explain death to patients and their families. This is not something that MDs are necessarily very good at a lot of times. Uh, they can know the alphabet soup of, uh, you know, the, de the chemicals to put in people, but, but uh, they don't as well have the personal kind of knowledge that is required because they go into their training at 22 mm -hmm. and where was I when I was 22 yeah. and uh, uh, so that uh, very little training in nutrition you know and that was true of the deals but I feel like that was a lack that I think maybe is being made up for now is uh, 
more needs to be put into nutrition because that would have been something A.T. still certainly would have appreciated mm -hmm. is the importance of good diet. And uh, always you come back to the rule of the artery is supreme. You know, such a simple thing, but that's true over and over again in every disease process. And uh, so maintain good circulatory status by good exercise, health, wellness. That's where DOs are at and that's where medicine should be at. Mm -hmm. And I think the MD schools have learned a lot because of that. I think they have seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, the osteopathic manipulation is part of that because you don't always need a pill for everything, you know. And uh, I'm proud that I'm not really on any prescription medicines yet. I'm taking some fish oil, I'm taking a, a, a baby aspirin every day because my doctor at uh, the VA said, yeah, yeah, I'll take a baby aspirin, you know, and I've read the literature, so I agree, I think so. But, uh, uh, you know, the way her, our country's health has gone in the last 20 years has just shocked me. I mean, uh, it has shocked me, and the increase in diabetes, and, the, you know, and I won't get into all of that, but uh, I think the osteopathic way was the, very much the right way, and uh, doctors fell into the trap of trying to find a pill for everything, and trying to, uh, you know, pain is the, is the fifth vital sign and all of that, and then addicting all these people to drugs. You know, it's, it's a sad thing. So there's a kind of a mess in the medical profession that's got to be sorted out. Mm -hmm. Do you think once OSU took over the school that you were in that... Pardon my allergies and everything, oh. but I'm... I, I, if you I need think. to take a break and get a tissue, I can... No, I'm fine. Um, do you think that once they took it over that they maintained some of those values that, that you thought were particularly um, important? Or do you oh, think, I think that that's they have. changed? I think they have. I, I, I hope they have, but I, I, I believe they have. I'm very impressed with the young students, you know, and I get to see them when I go to all these seminars, and, and I wonder how they could possibly be becoming doctors because they look like children, but, uh, you know, uh, that's because I'm an old guy, and old guys are supposed to think like that. But uh, I don't think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I don't think that the world's going to end, uh, you know, because of... You know, uh, no, I think I think that mm -hmm. I think that they're learning and they're seeing the importance of going back to some of the older things that have always been true. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, the osteopathic manipulation, I believe in it and I've actually benefited from it, but partly because of my size and partly because of my skepticism when I first got into the osteopathic college, I I was just never very good at it, but like I said, I don't have much mechanical aptitude, and it requires a bit of that, I think, to be able to do it well. Mm -hmm. And I did that in my practice, but I kind of stayed with necks and low backs and such, and I, I, I just, I did not do it well. But you know where I was practicing, and this is something many of the DO students will find out when they get into rural America, is that you're overwhelmed with the pathology that you have to deal with. And so the 20 minutes and things that you have to spend with the patient, or 15 minutes if you're HMO, if they, you know, I guess that's out of the thing now, but HMO's pressing on 10 minute visits, 15 minute visits, you can't do both. You can't educate a person about their diabetes and their heart disease and their smoking and do 20 minutes of manipulative. And so I, I did less of that because all of a sudden I'm thrown into these Wright City, Oklahoma, where you've got people living in the backwoods and living, you know, and they're, they're living at manual labor and they're getting injuries, cuts, broken bones, all of this thing. And so many diabetics, so much heart disease because of the heavy smoking in those areas that you are overwhelmed by the pathology that comes out of the woodwork there. I mean, and uh, so I was ready for it. And the school made me ready for it. Plus my background, you know, mm -hmm. as a medic and lab too. But, uh, so one of the challenges, and this is not unique to Oklahoma, this is, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, is how do you 
attract and retain health care providers in rural areas. And part of it, as I think you mentioned, there's these other like cultural things, right? That well, hopefully they're still working on attract, you know, and accepting people that may not have the straight four point. Because of my uh, problems with the engineering courses, I had a three point seven five average. And interestingly, I had interviewed also at the MD school at OU, and the dean of the school interviewed me. I was kind of surprised that they'd have a guy like that do it, but I found out he maybe had a reason. Uh, you know, I told him a little bit of my life, and I, I told him, you know, uh, this and that. He looked at my scholastic records, and what he told me, and I thought this was very telling, he said, well, Mr. Martin, I, I want you to understand that you are about 10 years older than the uh, people, most of the people we accept to medical school here. You know, you are 31, and uh, most of the uh, people I've interviewed are 21, 22. They will have 10 years more of service life they can give to their community. Uh, he said, do you have a family? I said, yes, I've got two small children, a wife and two small children. And he said, well, and he leaned forward to me, he said, Mr. Martin, I want you to understand that medicine is an asexual mistress and it will take you away from your wife and your children. Are you ready for that? And see, I'd already been accepted by the osteopathic college and so it wasn't as crushing to me as it would have been if this was the only school I had interviewed in. And I said, uh, yes, I think I'm ready for it. Uh, but he didn't say if I was accepted or not, but I knew right then I wasn't accepted. Mm -hmm. 3.75 wasn't good enough. All the ones he was accepting were 4.0 and they were 22. But what I could bring to the table was that life experience that I had had. And I knew that that was valued at the osteopathic college because they wanted guys who could take it, who could go out in these rural areas and would, not, would be able to handle the ICU patient and you know the critical patients in the rural areas. They couldn't call their friend Joe, the, you know, the surgeon or the, or the uh, internist or whatever, because we had no internists in Idabel for a long time. Until the last year I was working in Idabel, we didn't have an internist. And when he finally came, the uh, MDs and, the, and unfortunately one of the DOs there looked at him as an interloper because it would cut into their piece of the financial pie. And they didn't refer to him. And I did because I was working ERs, I was working IC, I was having to work ICU when I worked ER because the other doctors would leave town because they knew I could handle it and that's not fair. And that's not right, that was dangerous to me. I never had a lawsuit, but thank God, you know. And uh, so when he got there, I said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. You know, I would like for you to handle some of these ICU cases, you know, because I was intubating people, keep, you know, I hadn't run the ventilator. And, and he was indeed, mm -hmm. but I was happy he was there. And ironically, I got to uh, work around him again at the Choctaw Hospital there in Tallahena because he worked there in the ER a lot and we knew each other. Mm -hmm. I had a flat at the side of the road one time. He saw me, he was gonna help me fix it. No, it's fine, he's a good guy, Dr. Ward. But he's retired and I'm retired. And so, you know, so be it. So I, I, we're getting close to the end of the time that we had allotted, but I, I still I want to talk about this too in the capacity of. If you need to go over, that's fine. I mean, twelve o'clock is yeah, I can go past that because okay. I just have to get her there. They don't open at Mathnasium till three p.m. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Flexibility is good. Yeah. Um, but I, you've mentioned this in a couple of things that you've sort of described, but you, you've been a lot of different places, right? You had mm -hmm. this sort of like five year rule until you hit the VA or, mm -hmm. um, but I'm kind of curious about what you liked 
what attracted you or, or maybe made you shy away from some of those various places? Because you've been Carl Albert, mm -hmm. mental health. Well, that was not separate. That was something I did one half Thursday a week. Okay, I got it. I did that for additional income. I got it. Okay, and they needed someone, and none of the other doctors volunteered. And I had this problem. I could never say no. I always said yes. Okay, we need you to do work ER this weekend. We know you're not on. Okay, yeah. I'll do. Uh, you know, I did that one weekend. It was Christmas weekend, and uh, I'd done. We were doing 48-hour shifts in those days. 48 mm -hmm. hours. Uh, and the doctor that was supposed to be there had. Uh, he was an MD, by the way. He was a local tenants doctor, and he was supposed to take over through because it was a four-day weekend for Christmas. And he had uh, tried to pull his sports car away from a gas pump without taking the gas pump out of the car. And so it caused the gas tank to blow up, and he wouldn't hurt. But anyway, he was involved with all of that, and he was shooken up. So he couldn't come. So I had to work four whole days in that emergency room over Christmas weekend. Is that McCurtain County? Yes, at the McCurtain uh, Memorial Hospital. You know, with maybe two hours sleep here and there. And I swore I would never do that again, but the only, you know, it didn't happen again. Fortunately, it was one of those things, but I always said yes, I was sitting you know, And they probably could have eventually found somebody that had, but you know, and I kind of liked doing ER. Uh, it was, kind of left over from Vietnam because, you know, you live on your adrenaline and you feel like you're an orchestra conductor. You're able to, you, you, you know, you have to have a certain degree of ego strength to be a physician and do what you do as a physician. And I guess I like that, you know, it sort of feeds your ego in a way to be able to handle situations. Not that I didn't have things that went south and that devastated me, and, and all doctors do, but I knew I was in there pitching and I did the best I could do. Mm -hmm. know? And uh, so, but as to why I moved around, first I was uh, there in Idabel, but it was, I was, uh, I, I got married a second time, and it was to an ER nurse, and it was personal. Uh, I. I, by saying yes to everything, I wound up with 90 nursing home patient, patients in five different nursing homes in three different towns. That's rural medicine. Uh, either a doctor died and their patients had to have somebody to cover. Uh, doctor moved from, say, Valiant to Paris, Texas or something, you know, things like that. And so... Who would take over the, oh, good old Bill, he'll take them, you know. So, yes, I took them. But I'm not a businessman. I was just a doctor. I just wanted to be a doctor. And I didn't know how to manage that. I'd seen some of those docs that had been there for 40 years who would uh, manipulate their books and their, you know, bill for Medicare. But I was kind of naive about that. I'm naive in certain ways. But... I know the very first uh, Medicaid patient I had was a, a lady who had uh, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, she had uh, two small children. She was on Medicaid. And so I had to decide, am I going to put her in the hospital? Her white count was 15,000. Uh, this was, and, and I thought, you know, but she said, well, I can't, I can't afford to, I'm a single mother. And I, so I said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a shot of uh, was Claflin, I think, or Rosefrin, one of those new third. They were new then, third generation cephalosporins. I'm going to put you on some oral doxycycline, and I'm going to let you go home. But if you're not getting better, I'm going to put you in the hospital. Well, in two, three days, she was better, and so she was able to be home with her kids. And my count came down to normal, and all that. But I, by that time, I'd run her bill up to, in those days, it was 1983, 84. I'd run her bill up to probably 150 or $160. And so we billed that to uh, Medicaid. Three months later, I got the response 
32 cents. I got 32 cents out of that. I had to eat all of that. You know, the lab, the everything, pelvic exam, all the whole works. And I mentioned that to Dr. Maxwell, who was in practice then, very nice guy, another DO, good guy. And he said, Bill, I wish you'd told me if you had put her in the hospital, you'd have gotten at least $1,200 from Medicaid. I didn't know. I was trying to help this lady, you know? And uh, so anyway, I was there in Wright City until 1992. I wanted to save my second marriage, and I thought, well, I need a salary job. I'd gotten a letter from the medical director there at Tallahena. I hadn't even heard of Tallahena or the Veterans Center. I'd heard of Tallahena because they had a Choctaw Hospital, and I had to send OB patients there. But uh, didn't even know about the Veterans Center. And I thought, well, I'm a veteran. I mean, you know, it's a salary job, and uh, it would be a clear income, and I wouldn't have to pay my malpractice. They would cover me by federal torts. So I did that. I, I, I uh, left my practice, you know, notified her by getting the three-month waiting period, you know, and moved there, and uh, I didn't save my marriage. Um, she had uh, been seeing a guy that had been her boyfriend in high school. And once she found out that my office manager had embezzled this, and I didn't know until after I had left my office, she had embezzled us for $30,000. And not only that, she had not paid the uh, Social Security and taxes for my nurse and uh, for uh, the nurse aide that I had working with me as a, a x-ray team. And so I uh, wound up, you know, I, I came to uh, Tallahena in February of 92. And uh, by March, my, I knew that, that Shirley was going to leave me. And she did, and, and our divorce was final. It was a whirlwind in April. And at that same time, before she left me, she, she heard about this, knew that I was going to be in big trouble with the IRS. And I, they said, with penalties and interest, it's going to be $90,000 you need to pay us right now. Uh, and I couldn't. And so I had to work out a plan, and they you know, put a lien on me. Couldn't get a credit card, couldn't get anything for seven years. And uh, so the salary job was a refuge, even though I hadn't planned it that way. But they would pay you like $88,000 a year when all the guys in private practice were getting over $100,000. And that was back in 92. Um, so... I worked, uh, I, I left Tallahassee because everything had happened to me in Tallahassee and it was bad. You know, my wife left me, you know, I'm hit with the IRS and my mother died and she was in a nursing home, you know, at that point. And I had to handle that. So um, anyway, I, I went to Sulphur, but Sulphur was, the facility was very run down there, the Veterans Center there. And there was a, it, they, they'd had me fill in a couple of times at, Ardmore, and it was a little bigger town and everything, and so I went there. So I was in the veteran centers for uh, four and a half years, almost five years. And a friend of mine who was in my osteopathic class was the medical director at the Chickasaw Nation. And he was getting $134,000 a year, and I was getting $92,000 a year at that point at the veteran center. They'd raised this, but still nothing like what. But, you know, if you look at it, you know, you didn't have to pay fifteen or $20,000 in my practice and stuff, so there's kind of a wash there. But anyway, the, the last straw for me at the Veterans Center in 96 was that uh, they were having a budget cut, as they were over the last three years now. And the administrator told me, I want you to stop writing for all these IVs and all these antibiotics, I want you to send all these patients to the hospital, which was just about a mile away. Mercy Memorial there in Ardmore. And I said, 
But then you tell me I can't be a doctor. I'll be a traffic cop. I mean, we had a big argument over that. And I said, if you, look, this is nuts. I'm here to be a physician, to make diagnoses. And I thought our goal was to treat our veterans here, you know. Because many of these people, the, you know, were at the end of their life. And, and the family wanted us to treat them there. This was their home. So anyway, I was upset with the state and the veteran centers and with my administrator. And so when... Uh, when uh, the medical director at the Chickasaw Clinic called, said, listen, I'm going to move to uh, Dallas. And uh, I, you know, I just didn't know if you might be interested in this job. And I said, how much does it pay? And he told me, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And so right then I left the Veterans Center, swore I'd never go back again to the state and the Veterans Center. That's why you should never say never. But... Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, I, I worked at the Chickasaws for four and a half years, and uh, but uh, a nurse I had met in Tallahena I had corresponded with and eventually married, and she had come to Ardmore and lived with me, but she wanted to go back, and so I, I did. At, I'm trying to compress it. But so you left Chickasaw? I left the Chickasaws. Uh, it was partly a riff, but what it was, was they had uh, a Chickasaw princess who had finished her residency, and they put her in the clinic with me, and I showed her the ropes and how to do everything. And then they found that they had a $12 million budget shortfall. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they ever figured what happened to that. And so they let uh, about five or six doctors go, all of whom were not Native American, and I was one of them. And uh, so, anyway, I thought, okay, I'll uh, go back into private practice. Mm -hmm. And so, within a month, I was working at uh, McCullough and Carnahan's office there uh, in Ardmore. And so, I worked with them. And unfortunately, through all of that, my third marriage didn't work out, and again, I'd blame mostly myself. But I was still in love with her, and I felt like maybe we could make it work out. And so she kind of threw the gauntlet down to me in, uh, in, in 2006. We were going to, I was visiting her in Tallahanna, actually Albion, but Tallahanna. And we were going to McAllister that day to go shopping. And she said, would you ever consider coming back down here? I said, yeah, I thought about it. You know, I wasn't too keen on it for a while, but I think that'd be a good way to end my practice life, but I didn't think I'd be ready to do it then. And she said, why don't you go up and see Mr. Roy up there and see if they have an opening for me? And I knew what she was doing. I said, she, was, she was saying, put up, shut up, you know. So I said, yeah. And we just happened to be right here at, at Highway 63A, mm -hmm. so I said, oh, turn right up here, because she was driving. We came up here, and Roy had a, a fish on the line. He was thinking about getting a guy from the correctional center to be to come in. But he knew me because I had worked here at uh, Tallahanna for seven months, and then I'd gone to Arden. And so he said, well, I know what I'm getting with you, so I'm going to hire you. I said, oh. Okay. <laughs> so you basically walked in and had a job. Yes. It was that simple. It was that quick. And it was quick enough that I really wasn't quite prepared for that. So I had to go back and tell Drs. Carney and McCullough, and we were working fine. And I see him at seminars all the time now, and he would always say, why don't you come back and work with us? You're the best doctor you ever worked with. I said, well, no, I get, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, that was why. You know, uh, I was rift from the Chickasaws. They didn't say it was fired exactly, but they put the Indian princess in that job. What does that mean? She was an Indian princess. So they at one of their festivals or something, you oh, know. Okay. But they, she was literally a Chickasaw princess in one of their festivals, and she had just gotten out of her residency in internal medicine, and uh, so she was quote more qualified because. You know, at that time, 
I was not board certified. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that until I joined Carnahan and McCullough. And I wanted to be that because I knew I had to be from then on. Mm -hmm. You know, I was old school and I didn't have it. So I, uh, I gone ahead and got board certified, got a 90 on the test and, you know, that's fine. But, but, uh, uh, she lasted there about three months. I was seeing 40 patients a day and I was busting butt to do that. But I was also managing the diabetic uh, camp that we had there. And I really enjoyed that because I'd see diabetics that would come in with 400 sugars. And by us having them walk for half a mile or a mile every day and giving them instruction on how to build a, a diabetic diet, they'd go out of there with sugars of 150. I mean, it was, it was so gratifying. One of the most gratifying things I've ever done as a physician was working with the Chickasaws. But uh, they put her in there and basically came in and said that, uh, you know, we're going to uh, replace you and put her in there. And that was it. And uh, uh, that hurt, but... Uh, and you said she lasted three months? Yeah, because she was seeing 12 patients a day. And that was too much? Is that what? No, that wasn't enough. Oh, I was seeing 35, 40 a day. I mean, that was too much for her. It wasn't enough it, for she, the hospital. Yeah, she, she wasn't able to cope with that degree of volume and that degree of pathology. And I was. I was prepared for that. I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes from training a lot of it. You know, as well as, you know, she was like 27 or 28, you know, and I was at that point in my mid-40s. You know, turned 50. But uh, anyway, uh, I had what was kind of gratifying was uh, some of the patients I'd had there at the Chickasaw Clinic once I went to Carn McCullough because they had Medicare or other instruments, they started coming to me there. But uh, I, I really liked working with Chickasaws. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it was. And, and they do give Native American preference. If you have two equally qualified people, they're going to pick the Native American, which is why they do that. That's what they wanted. Um, but, uh, so when you moved to the VA this, this last time, and maybe while you were there in, in different VA areas, mm -hmm. I understand the administrative frustration. Yes. Um, and that's... And that continued. Public. I mean, that's... That's so, just part of it. Yeah. You're always going to have that clash between medical people and administrative people mm -hmm. because there is sort of uh, a difficulty in communication because we think in different ways, we speak different language and different jargon. And unfortunately, uh, in the veteran centers, going way back, maybe not so much now, but going way back, there was the... They used to take doctors that were foreign medical graduates that got uh, degrees by correspondence or something. And so they did not respect doctors. And uh, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think I was the only board certified doctor for a long time in the veteran centers of all the seven centers. But I was there because I had chosen to be. Mm -hmm. I had wanted to be with my ex-wife. And I'm still with my ex-wife. She, she didn't trust me enough to marry me again, but we go places, we go to New York and California and everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. But she's starting to have some problems and so with caregiver stress is kind of, she's, she's starting to have some uh, problems yeah. too. As I was too, not severely, but enough that it was worrying me about my ability to perform. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, so how did your relationship with, for example, the patients when you're at the VA, was that something? It was good, it was good. But we were getting so many guys in who were younger than me who were addicted to drugs, thanks to the VA, the federal VA mainly. And so they had really rough lives. They were manipulators and they were liars. And, they, you know, all the things you see in the drug culture, we were getting there. And so you had to not only be a physician, you had to be a psychiatrist, that was one of the lackings in the state veteran system. They didn't have onboard psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. And certainly in Tallahena, we didn't have one anywhere near the area. Mm -hmm. And you had to deal with dual diagnosis patients. They might have cognitive dysfunction either because of drug use or their dementia developing. 
They'd also be bipolar, schizophrenic because of drug use. Very difficult job. And, uh, of course, it was acute care, too, because we were still doing, basically, we were doing what I wanted to do when I left that other job because they weren't letting me do it. We were treating them there, and the families usually wanted them treated there. This was their home. They'd often been there years, and so by the time they got to the end, we could do hospice care for them, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that was gratifying, and I, I enjoyed doing that. And But I was getting older and I was starting to have some memory lapses about little things, not big things, but uh, it was, it was, I could see that I was nearing the end of my rope there. I, I needed to, because it was getting to be even more difficult because of the budget cuts and all that. And uh, I was, so, you know, it, yeah. was, it was, it was time for me to take a break. And I thought about, well, you know, maybe I'll go back to something else, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure I'll do that. Uh, so what do you tell people if they, if they talk to you about getting into the same sort of line of work in the same area? Like, what's your advice for... They have to be very uh, strong in knowing how and when to say no so they can have some sort of balance in their work life and their personal life. Because for me, I, I kind of, I think, used my work life as a, as a therapy for all the problems I had in my personal life. And that doesn't work. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of your life, I remember hearing this somewhere, when you're on your deathbed, you don't want to say, or when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to say, Gee, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. And no, I, I wish I had spent more time with my children, even though I still have them and I have good relationships with them. There was so much I missed. Mm -hmm. And that's not healthy. That's not good. So I'm thinking about the... So OU incoming guy. students. Well, I'm thinking about the OU oh. director right here. Oh, well, he was absolutely your career. right. He was absolutely right. And I, I have the sense because the way he was saying it was almost like it was a reflection on his own personal mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a good book out by an MD who uh, went into oncology. But it was a, surgeon, a surgical oncology. Uh, actually, it was a, a neurosurgeon. And it's called When Breath Becomes Air. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's your last breath, of course, then it just becomes air. It's no longer breath. This was a quote from some count years ago. And this guy, ironically enough, I didn't know this when I picked up the book at the library in Hartshorn. Uh, he was a 37-year-old neurosurgeon at just beginning the peak of his career, you know, your early four is going to be the peak of your practice. And he discovers he's got metastatic lung cancer, and he was not a smoker. And so he lost his ability to do the thing he loved. He was tops. He was tops in his field. And he was going to go into research and all of this had uh, a child on this but when he was going into deciding what he was going to be when he went into college he went into pre-med and English literature and so when he knew he was dying because he had good ability to put words on paper, he decided he would write a book while he was going through this experience. Mm -hmm. And he did. And it's not a long book. And I think it would be eye-opening to any people going into medicine about the balance in life, the importance of that. And uh, anyway, uh, Paul Kalanithi is his name, and When Breath Becomes Air is the book. I'd sure recommend that to any doctor. So 
So do you think it's still true that you you have to choose family or work if you're going to medical There's always field? going to be that because when you're a good physician, you're going to be dedicated and you accept the fact that this person's life is in your hands. You are responsible every minute of the day for the people you're seeing. But I think there's a way to do it. I think the fact that more and more guys are in group practices now is good. I think that you'll have to see that start happening more in rural areas. There's going to have to be guys that will work together. As long as I was working with uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Uh, uh, oh gosh, I didn't think I'd feel, uh, been up some three, but that's yeah. Which uh, uh, where, uh, as long as I had two other DOs, you know that we could rotate. Oh, like in McCartan County. Call. Yeah, you've got to be able to rotate call. You've got to know when to say no about taking too many nursing home patients because I did that, and that's what killed me off there. I mean, was, I was at the peak, and I could have continued in practice if I had room to breathe. Mm -hmm. But I would uh, go to the hospital at 7 a.m. I'd make rounds. I'd have anywhere from 5 to 20 patients in the hospital. I would go back to my office. I would have to drive uh, you know, to Wright City, which was 30 miles from the hospital. I would see patients there all day, get out of there at 5 or 6, come back to the hospital, because I made Rick two rounds a day. I was one of the few doctors that did that, but all the good ones I saw did that, and I did that. And uh, then I would go home at 8, 9 o'clock. And I'd think, well, I'll make up for that the next day. But the next day, you'd have some disaster happen, a cold or something. You had, so, and then as I got more and more nursing home patients, I went from, you know, starting out with like uh, 30 of them and then wound up with 90 of them. So you go home, but you're not home because then the nursing homes start calling you. And, you know, uh, some nurses are more skilled than others. Some nurses are more intelligent than others about what's going on with the patient. So you don't know if you're getting the right information or not. And so, well, maybe I better go see this guy. And I was a dinosaur. You know, when I started my practice in Wright City, I, uh, I made house calls. I did that for you know, two or three years. Uh, and... No matter what they say about rural doctors, they don't pay you in chickens or eggs. They just don't pay you if they don't pay you. <laughs> but, but, uh, but that was okay because that was, that was what I felt a doctor should be doing. But again, I didn't mind the store. I didn't know about the business end of it. And the doctors that know the business end of it wind up with the Mercedes and, you know, but, uh, I didn't care about a Mercedes, and because of my environmental bent, I always believed in getting a green car that you know, got you 34 miles per gallon, which is what I got right now, Ford Focus, and I'm going to buy another car that's going to be you know, conservative on gas, decrease my carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that retirement is enabling me to do is I, I love reading. And I'm reading fiction by Steinbeck, Hemingway, Graham Greene. I love that. And uh, I'll be available if anyone wants me or needs me to, you know, address certain things. Uh, you know, the graduating nurses uh, at the here at the Votech uh, in in uh, May asked me to address them. And so I tried to boil down some life lessons as best I could for them. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I felt there were certain things that they need to know going into nursing, and so I, I tried to help them with that. Uh, be honest. You know, be accountable. Uh, be brave because you're going to encounter things that you really don't want to encounter. And, uh, and I told him, you know, even if you can't be brave, act brave. Fall back on your training, because nobody's going to know the difference.
Mm-hmm. You know? and, uh, and that's been true all my life. So. I think that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. This was... We're five minutes over. That was pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Um, no, I think this was what I was interested in. I think this is... Um, it's a really... Uh, it's a broader perspective than I thought... I, than I knew coming mm-hmm. in, which um, I think is part of the important part of yeah. being able to tell that well, story. Well, these young docs got to understand it, but if I had been 10 years younger... I could have maybe handled certain things better or not. I don't know. But I would have appreciated having the foreknowledge. Mm. You know, hindsight's always better than first thing. Right. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, mentors so, make a difference, too. It yeah. sounds like you had some of those. Yeah, I did that, but I was too hard on them, I think. I uh, wanted very much for them to be excellent. And... I, you know, I was a control freak. You know, doctors can get that way. And uh, so in looking back at that, when I was uh, mentoring uh, that uh, the interns, I was a little too much, I left, I think, of leftover military in me or something, because I'm... And so that... that and I was too stressed at that time about other things too. I think I, I, I so I turned it over to Dr. Maxwell again after that because I thought, no, I, you know, I'm not the right person to be doing this. Well, at least you could acknowledge that about yourself, yeah. though. That's important. You have to be honest about yourself. You have to be able to. That's the other thing is that in winding every practice, you have to realize when it's time to hang it up too. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, nobody wants to. Yeah. Nobody wants to, because that's your life, that's your identity. But uh, gotta know. Well, I'm sure you'll find ways to continue. I know that's yeah, part of your plan. Yep.